Today's scripture lesson is from the book of Luke, chapter 10, verses 25 through 37. It's the common English Bible translation. A legal expert stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to gain eternal life? Jesus replied, what is written in the law? How do you interpret it? He responded, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your being, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus said to him, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But the legal expert wanted to prove that he was right. So he said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho. He encountered thieves who stripped him naked, beat him up, and left him near death. Now it just so happened that a priest was also going down the same road. When he saw the injured man, he crossed over to the other side of the road and went on his way. Likewise, a Levite came by that spot, saw the injured man, and crossed over to the other side of the road and went on his way. A Samaritan, who was on a journey, came to where the man was. But when he saw him, he was moved with compassion. The Samaritan went to him and bandaged his wounds, tending them with oil and wine. Then he placed the wounded man on his own donkey, took him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took two full days' worth of wages and gave them to the innkeeper. He said, take care of him, and when I return, I will pay you back for any additional costs. What do you think? Which one of these three was a neighbor to the man who encountered thieves? Then the legal expert said, the one who demonstrated mercy toward him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. So, dear friends, we continue uh, grappling with this parable and dissecting it for ourselves uh, and the situation in our society and in our neighborhood, asking who is our neighbor. And let me say quite clearly and unequivocally that this is a deceptively simple parable. But it is revolutionary parable. And we can start with, today we can look at the priest and Levite and then that Samaritan, but starting really with priest and Levite. And it will be naive and a clear show of ignorance of context, thinking that these were just regular travelers like me or you or anyone around us, who just happen to be religious professionals. We need to remember that Jews at the time of Jesus were de facto hierarchy. That means government by priests. And that was certainly true in Jerusalem and in Judea at the time of Jesus. At the time, this arrangement of rule by priest was about 200 years old system. In my Friday message, I mentioned where it most likely started with uh, Simon Maccabee uh, from the Hasmonean dynasty. They were all priests and kings at the same time. They were from the priestly family, uh, Maccabees. And later, when the Romans took care or occupied uh, Judea, uh, when Romans took over, they, they had their occupying military presence there. They were collecting their taxes, 
the Roman taxes, but everyday ruling, everyday life was actually administered from Jerusalem temple by those Jerusalem priests. And those were primarily, of course, high priests, but beneath him there was an entire hierarchy, ranks of priests divided to at least 12 different layers, just like regular government and administration. So under high priest there was Sagan, in Greek it was Strategos, we would probably say this time something like first secretary, and beneath directors of weekly operations and directors of daily operations, and there was a chief treasurer priest and a number of his subordinates, uh, overseers, ordinary priests in number and in ranks and different responsibilities, and finally Levites in their different functions and ranks. And all those priests and Levites were vested with not only religious responsibilities, but with power, political power, not only religious. The power over daily lives of regular people. Priests, Levites were more than just religious professionals regardless of their rank. They were part of a ruling elite vested in keeping and protecting status quo. The closest which comes to my mind would be a medieval European prince archbishop of Salzburg, for instance. That would be from the time of, uh, uh, from the time of uh, Mozart, Amadeo Mozart, uh, Colorado Mansfeld was the Prince Archbishop of Salzburg and he had control over Mozart. He could dismiss him, send him or allow him to compose in Vienna, otherwise his subject would be in Salzburg. So those were authorities similar to uh, the, the authorities of priests in Jesus' time. In our recent times, we can think of Martin Luther King, who was also a minister, but had a political authority, or William Barber II this, in this time. But those are probably not the right examples because they are not part of establishment. They are not trying to preserve status quo. They are trying to change it. So even though they are having a political authority, that's actually political authority which is in opposition. In our recent past, it should be, closest will be probably Billy Graham or Jerry Falwell Sr or Franklin Graham now and Falwell Jr. this time, or Paula White or Joel Austin. Those will be, and just don't give me that they are just Baptist ministers. They are not. They have much larger responsibility. But in Jesus' time, that was even further because they were vested with political responsibility. That was their function. They represented certain culture, paradigm, political system. And when Jesus took aim at priests and Levites, it did not matter how high or low ranking they were. It was an on entire abusive system of religion, which was not there to liberate and care for people, but the very opposite to oppress and exploit them. That was why Jesus was aiming at the priest and Levite at his parable here or in his other living and examples. That was one of the characteristic and permanent themes of Jesus. Do you know the parable of lost sheep? 
That is that the shepherd has 100 sheep and one gets lost and he would leave those 99 alone and go and search for that lost one. And when he finds the lost one, takes it on his shoulder and carries that back to his flock. And returning, throws a marvelous party for everyone, rejoicing that the lost sheep was found and returned to the flock. That's again a relatively deceptively simple parable, but it is similarly radical in its criticism of egotistic religious elites. And in order for us to better understand, I will now ask Sarah to read from, for us from prophecy of Ezekiel. Uh, so please, and you can step forward and read for us. So this is from Ezekiel 34, verses one through five and nine through 11. The Lord's word came to me. Human son, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, the Lord God proclaims to the shepherds, doomed to the shepherds of Israel. They care only for themselves. Shouldn't shepherds tend the flock? You drink the milk, you wear the wool, and you slaughter the fat animals, but you don't tend the flock. You don't support the weak, heal the sick, bind up the injured, bring back the strays, or seek out the lost, but instead you use force to rule them with injustice. Without a shepherd, my flock was scattered, and when it was scattered, it became food for all the wild animals. So shepherds, hear the Lord's word. The Lord God proclaims, I'm against the shepherds. I will hold them accountable for my flock and I will put an end to their tending the flock. The shepherds will no longer tend them because I will rescue my flock from their mouths and they will no longer be their food. The Lord God proclaims, I myself will search for my flock and seek them out. Yes, and in this context of a Hebrew Bible prophecy, you can see how this simple parable about lost sheep suddenly gains much stronger, more powerful political or anti-establishment edge. Now you know why and how this innocent parable of lost sheep could be a political jab and powerful protest. You might be downtrodden, neglected and abused by your leaders, but God is coming to rescue. God does not care, God does care about you, unlike those uh, shepherds. God does support the weak. God cares and wants to heal the sick. God does bind up the injured and seek out the forgotten and lost. And in the Good Samaritan parable, God is doing it in the most radical and provocative manner. And now I will be talking about Samaritans. Because here we are abandoned by political and religious elites. God comes in the hated and despised person, Samaritan. Priest and Levi went by, not paying attention to an injured sheep. God comes in the person of a Samaritan. And the best way to describe it within the context of Jewish mentality of that time, he, God comes, that rescue, that compassion comes 
in generally despised and hated person. Samaritans were target of Jewish national religious chauvinism. Samaritans were a safety valve for those priests and Levites. They were escaped goats because if the situation was really bad, at least they were not like those Samaritans. Samaritans were proverbially those others. They were the exact opposite of the priest and Levite. Because priest and Levite, they were of a pure blood. While well, Samaritans were considered to be of mixed race. Combination of those left in Samaria and combined with people who were moved in by Assyrian Empire. So against pure blood of priests and Levites who until today are claiming that their Y chromosome among Kohans, Kohans, the priests in their families, is still the same and shows the same lineage until today. So against pure blood you have here a bastard mixed race. Against true religion, those are priests and Levites pontifying over true Orthodox religion, and over that is this corrupted and false religion. Against Jerusalem temple, the only temple which there should be, there are the Samaritans who worship God in a different mountain in Samaria. And nationalistic and religious pride on another side, on one side, and true humble humanity of Samaritans on the other. That is whom God sends. That is how God comes to us. Of an impure race, questionable religion, and unpretentious, caring, loving humanity. Just like us, we are also abandoned, lied to, and abused. We all are familiar with those chauvinistic chants, USA and the like, make America great again. Pandering what is presented as true religious values while families are broken on the border and children put in cages, unarmed black people are killed by those who should protect them. We all know about already flimsy health care being threatened. And in that situation, God is coming in a compassionate person of mixed race, questionable religion, and with unpretentiousness of compassion. God comes to us in a Muslim refugee child, in undocumented dreamer, in Bangladeshi fruit vendor, in Black Lives Matter activist waking us from liturgy, in form of Indian, Chinese, Iranian, doctor or Filipino, Caribbean or Kenyan nurses fighting for the universal health care, in form of the homeless people moved into our neighborhood and shaking us up and challenging our self-image offering us a mirror and grounding our humanity. That is the way God is coming to us while we are being abandoned by those who are 
pretending to be of pure blood and true religion. God is coming to us in pure race and questionable religion, yet full of compassion. Amen.